This is Paul Ralph, who is presenting possible core theories for software engineering. So please, Paul. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm working under the assumption that one way to generate a general theory of software engineering or general theory in any domain is to integrate a variety of existing core theories that apply at different levels of abstraction or different levels of analysis. Today I'm going to talk about five such core theories. I'm going to talk about each one very briefly. Please hold your questions to the end because I don't want to get bogged down in one of the five and then not get to talk about the other ones. So the first one I want to talk about is complex adaptive systems theory. Now, Complex adaptive systems theory is used in economics to explain increasing returns. It's used in biology to explain how more complex life evolves from less complex life. It's used in a lot of different domains. And it also applies to software engineering projects, specifically at the project level. So if a system is an in a collection of interconnected elements, a complex system is a system that exhibits emergence. And emergence is behavior that is not predictable from the system's component parts. Okay. An adaptive system is one that can modify itself to respond to changing conditions. This is not just uh, deterministic logic, but something that can rewrite itself. So a group of people in a room, us, we're a complex adaptive system. We exhibit emergent behavior, like running late, although that is somewhat predictable. Um, and then we can take steps to uh, modify our, ourselves uh, so that we can change our behavior. Now. Software engineering projects largely are complex adaptive systems or at least can be modeled as such. Now what does this mean? In practice, this has a really interesting implication. The methods literature broadly suggests that the more complicated and complex your project is, the bigger the project, the more bits that it has, the more you need to plan for it. So the idea is that if you're doing a very small, simple project, you don't really have to plan it because we kind of know how it will go. You can just wing it. But if you're doing a large project involving lots of people, lots of overhead communication, uh, we have to plan more. But what complexity theory says is that the more complex the situation, the less useful planning is because complexity means you can't predict it. So the less predictable your situation, the less useful it is to plan for it because your plans rarely work out. Um, this is a really interesting scenario. So we did a study of a, a company in the UK that had an interesting characteristic. They were a somewhat autonomous team within an organization and they had no imposed method. Nobody was telling them you have to do it this way or that way. They could kind of do whatever they wanted as long as they produced good results. And what we found was that when they encountered a project that initially seemed very simple, but as the project went on, it became clear to them that it was more and more complex, more complex than they thought. There's this question, will they respond to greater complexity by increasing their methodicalness and their planning, or by trying to increase their responsiveness and their adaptiveness? And we, what we found was that um, they took specific actions to become more responsive, and they abandoned most of their planning activity. And it worked. Not, not that it would always work, but in this case, it worked. And we thought that was very interesting. Our second theory uh, is my theory. It's my theory of the software development process. This is not a general theory of software engineering. This is a theory about how single teams develop complex software systems. It does not describe how multiple teams develop a system. It does not describe massly distributed activity like open source projects that have lots of people working in different countries. It describes how single teams or individuals build complex systems. And, what, and many of you have seen this before, uh, so I won't dwell on it, but it essentially says that there's a design agent and they engage in three basic sorts of processes, making sense of the world, organizing the perceptions about the world, that's sense making, co-evolution, I'll come back to that in a second, and implementation, implementation is building the system. Co-evolution is an observable phenomenon in development teams. Co-evolution is a rapid oscillation between your understanding of the problem and your understanding of the thing that you're going to build. Um, it happens in minutes, possibly an hour, but not in days and weeks. This is not prototyping. It is not the evolution of software over time. Co-evolution is a very fast-acting thing. You can see it in meetings where people will draw different diagrams on whiteboards and as they're exploring this thing that they're going to build, they realize that they've misunderstood 
something fundamental about the problem. And then they run back and they, they change some of the model and they think about, well, what does this mean? And, and that reconceptualization of the problem triggers more reconceptualization of the thing that you want to build. And that rapid oscillation, that back and forth between your understanding of the problem and your understanding of the design space uh, is what we call coevolution. Coevolution is largely not discussed in software engineering. There are some exceptions. Uh, but if you, for instance, look at the new SE 2013 curriculum, this, th people just don't talk about this. This is the fundamental mechanism through which design candidates are generated and understood. Now, what does this mean practically for software projects? It means lots of things. One, it means we need to teach coevolution, uh, which we don't, largely, most of us. Second thing is that the temporal or role separation of analysis, design, implementation, and testing is deeply flawed. What I mean by this is, if you say to somebody, you're an analyst and you're a programmer, that is definitely confused and probably counterproductive because designers explore the design space as a way of understanding the problem. Testers do lots of analysis. And programmers do lots of analysis and lots of design work. So when we try to divide design activity into these categories, design, programming, implementation, testing, um, either temporally or you do one and you do the other, this is innately confused. And this is causing a lot of problems in our systems. It also means that fixed price, fixed schedule contracts are very unlikely to work in the development of complex systems because you can't, you, you don't totally, you, what am I trying to say? Because you understand the problem by building the solution, not independently of building the solution. And if you accept that you understand problems by building solutions, the idea that you would know how much it will cost to solve the problem before you've built the solution is rather absurd. Um, so this is the main implications of SCI theory. Uh, Steve just, um, just discussed a grounded theory study. Um, this theory is supported by four such studies um, and a large survey of 1,400 developers. Now, next one, theory of boundary objects. This is a sociological theory. Um, a boundary object is something that is plastic enough to be used by different people with different contexts, or sorry, in different contexts. So if you draw a diagram, um, a use case diagram, for instance, and you give it to a user group and have like a focus group with the user group, and then you use the same diagram to discuss the design of the system with the other developers. That's a boundary object. It's an object that crosses boundaries. It's an object that's solid enough to retain its identity in different contexts, but plastic enough to be used in different contexts by different people for different purposes. That's a boundary object. Now, how do boundary objects come up in, in development? Lots of different kinds of models are sorts of boundary objects. Developers externalize their cognition about the world into boundary objects. There's lots of reasons for externalizing your cognition. Um, one is memory. You just you, you can't keep everything in your head at once, and you have to write it down somewhere. Another is communication. You draw a diagram or show it to some other person to help you explain a phenomenon. And a third is to manage complexity. When you're trying to solve a problem that is, that is so complex that you can't hold it in your mind all at once, you have to externalize your cognition about the problem into a large diagram so that you can focus on one bit and then move back to the context and then focus on another bit and move back to the context. Um, so developers externalize their cognition into boundary objects. When you externalize your cognition about the context into a boundary object, you create a conceptual model. When you externalize your cognition about that a, a design artifact into a boundary object, you create a design model. So this is a theory from sociology that helps us understand um, how we use auxiliary artifacts in software engineering. Now what does it mean? There's an interesting thing that we found in a study of a scrum team. We, we found that um, we, we found a kind of boundary objects paradox. There was an intense pressure to externalize your, the, the product owner's understanding of the domain into some kind of boundary object such that when the product owner left for vacation or was ill or whatever, um, the, the rest of the team could proceed in his or her absence by referring to this boundary object. The problem was that any boundary object detailed enough to answer the kind of questions that would come up was so big that it was unusable practically without the writer present to explain to you where you should look and what you should look for. 
This is a boundary objects paradox. Everything that's got enough information that you need is too complex to use. That's what we found in this particular case. Our next theory is a psychological theory of group mind called transactive memory. Um, in transactive memory theory, teams divide themselves into specialists. Uh, this is over time, right? When the team first comes together, they may or may not be specialists. But over time, they develop specialism. Now, each specialist in the team has memory and meta-memory. Memory is where your domain knowledge resides. Memory is where you, you know stuff about the world and about your process. Meta-memory are your beliefs about your memory. Meta-memory also includes your knowledge of what the other people in your team know. So for a team to be effective, you have to optimize both memory, domain knowledge, and meta-memory, what you know about the rest of your team. So that when something comes in to you and you don't know how to deal with it, you know who to ask. You know who to distribute other a tasks to if you can't deal with them. Now, why is transactive memory interesting in software development practice? Transactive memory provides an explanation for why practices like peer programming and peer code reviews have long-term positive impacts on team performance beyond the elimination of short-term bugs. Because what peer programming and peer code reviews and similar peer interactions do is help the team optimize its meta-memory. It helps people understand what are the specialisms of the other people around them so that they can better re, uh, retask activities, so that they know who to ask when they get stuck. They know whose expertise to consult. That's an interesting thing about transactive memory. My last theory of the five is a theory of cognitive biases. This one many of you may be familiar with. A cognitive bias is a systematic deviation from, ra from um, optimal reasoning. And there are many, many cognitive biases, like at least 200. Many of them are related or are expressions of the same underlying cognitive phenomena uh, including heuristics, or sort of mental shortcuts, and illusions, both perceptual illusions and lots of other kinds of illusions, like the illusion of control or the illusion of superiority. Now, in practice, in software development projects, cognitive biases lead to what you might call behavioral anti-patterns. Everyone knows what a design pattern is, right? Anti-pattern is a design pattern you want to avoid, like blob object, where all the code in an object-oriented design is in one object. A behavioral anti-pattern is, is like a, a pattern of management or a pattern of thinking or a pattern of uh, acting in the world that you want to avoid, that is toxic. Uh, as an example, a, a behavioral anti-pattern is the failure to effectively explore the solution space for a particular project. So what does this mean? Let me, uh, let me give you some specific examples. Um, when we replicate stereotypes, uh, from, the, from the world. We replicate designs we've already seen instead of innovating. That's the failure to innovate. That, that's a very powerful uh, anti-pattern. Another one is confirmatory testing. When we, we write tests that confirm that the software works instead of finding the bugs, that's a behavioral anti-pattern. Another one is optimistic effort ef estimation. So that's when we, we are over-optimistic in how long something is going to take or how much work it will take. All of these anti-patterns that are very common in software projects can be traced back to underlying cognitive psych uh, psychological phenomena. Now, the cool thing about this is there's a vast psychological literature on de-biasing, on de-biasing participants that we can leverage in software development to inhibit the biases that cause the anti-patterns. That's, uh, that's what planning poker is. Planning poker, the, uh, the game that you play to estimate effort where everyone has cards and you drop them at the same time. Planning poker is a practice designed to inhibit anchoring bias. It doesn't stop optimis uh, optimistic estimation, but it inhibits anchoring bias. It's very simple. It costs nothing to do. You can explain it to people in five minutes, and it's kind of fun. We need more stuff like that. We need more stuff like that. So. They, that's a whirlwind tour of five psychological, sociological, and management theories that might become th core theories from reference disciplines that we could use in software engineering as a basis to uh, integrate them into a, core th into a general theory. Thank you very much. And does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thank you.